Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This next presentation is about the principles of cost application, and this uh, presentation is made from the slide deck following a um, one day cost application course, which includes uh, practical exercises, but these will be omitted for the purpose of this presentation. During this cost in course, we discuss the concepts of back slabs and complete cast off. We discuss the concept of how long to keep the plaster in place, management of displaced and undisplaced fractures, the use of analgesia or conscious sedation, the concept of manipulation and molding and three-point pressure, the necessity to consider the joints above and below a fracture, the functional positions of various uh, uh, routine casts, maintenance or reduction, frequency of x-rays, the use of casts in children's fractures, uh, protective weight bearing, uh, injured limb form and plaster removal. I will now proceed with a presentation which takes some of these points out for the sake of this tutorial. First of all, some helpful hints when applying all costs. With regards to positioning, it's critical that the application is done with a degree of comfort. Make sure that the patient, the holder, and the applicator are the most, in the most comfortable position to avoid lifting and handling the problems and use all aids that are available. Keep close to the patient, bend your knees, and keep your back straight. Have assistance to hold the limb where needed and do not ask the patient to hold the injured limb themselves as they will fatigue and become uncomfortable. Insist on help if necessary. The use of the stocking neck, net undercast uh, sleeves. Um, these should not be used if the fracture is being manipulated and be cautious not to fold the stocking net in over the undercast padding before the first layer of casting material has been applied, as this will cause the stocking net and padding to migrate into inside the cast with time. Also, when folding the stocking net back over the casting material before it is set, be careful not to pull it too hard, as it might create a ridge in the cast material leading to a pressure sore. With regards to the padding, it is best to pad the bony areas with felt because felt does not compress over time. However, we often use Western foam. Casts must fit well, so apply a single layer of undercast padding firmly, smoothly, and evenly. There are many different types of padding available, and it's important to understand which type you are using, the difference between uh, soft band and uh, fell band is something that can be felt physically. Do not make the cast loose by padding too much, as this can allow um, fracture movement and uh, damage to the skin. With regard to the casting materials, remember that they have different dipping techniques, setting times. The edges are sharp in some than others, specifically in the newer uh, uh, synthetic cast materials. The roughness or smoothness of the outside may vary. Um, and as well as uh, the number of layers required for strength, rigidity, and flexibility. You can use strategically placed slabs um, to cut down the total number of bandages. But the bottom line is that thick casts are unnecessary. They generate more exothermic reaction during the setting process, and they become more difficult to remove and are very uncomfortable to the patients. Some products allow flexibility, such as soft cast, and these can be used as an advantage, specifically at the edges of the cast. And it's important that we check the variations um, of the casting material that is being used um, and that they are compatible with the patient's diagnosis. With regards to uh, synthetic casting, and the same applies to gypsona, a one centimeter overlap on each spiral turn will end up with one layer of casting material. 50% overlap translates to two layers, and a 66% uh, um, overlap 
23 lines. <clears throat> so some important uh, aspects regarding applying a gypsoma plaster of Paris cast. Position the limb before starting the application of the cast. Apply felt to any sharp bony areas uh, and a layer of undercast padding. Um, as mentioned, make the underlast uh, undercast padding as uniform as possible. Soak the bandages fully. Roll the bandages on starting at one end. Do not pull, rather roll. Form tucks as necessary to accommodate the changes in limb diameter, specifically in the lower limb. Smooth and rub the bandages, bandages continuously to bond and laminate the plaster of Paris of gypsoma uh, from, that is impregnated in, in, in the bandage into itself and hold it still while it is setting. It is important that uh, you avoid any point pressure with your fingers. Use only the flat palm of your hand. Remember that if you do leave a slight dent on, with a finger, it may translate to a bigger impression internally, which will cause a pressure sore. As mentioned earlier, have assistance to help with holding the limb in one position so that you can concentrate on uh, the application. With regards to a synthetic cast, similar um, concept applies, but it is more important to have sufficient padding over the bony areas. Remember to soak the bandage completely, but once, uh, immediately once the uh, foil packaging is released, the bandage does start, or the, the um, synthetic casting material does start uh, hardening, and so you do have to start working immediately on uh, opening the bandages and do not let your assistants or assisting staff uh, prematurely open these bandages. A synthetic cast should be used with caution when there's danger of swelling, uh, on, for example post-operatively on flesh or on fresh fractures, uh, as there is far less uh, give and uh, uh, ability for um, the cast material to um, relieve the pressure once it is set. If the cast requires splitting to relieve tightness, it will probably need to be completely bivalved to totally allow, allow relief of symptoms. A gypsona cast can be split in one layer, and sorry, in one line. The application of casts and splints is a important part of non-operative management of fractures and has been well described in the literature. Some of the newer products that are available include um, the one-step, single-step splintage materials such as Dynacast Prelude or one-step splints. These already have padding. It's important to apply them with the padding side against the skin or against the soft tissues and um, understand that it takes longer to set. So once the bandage, once the um, splint has been applied and the bandage has been rolled on, it is important to hold it in position for the, until it is completely set. Um, if you take uh, relax that position, the limb will fall into a null position. Also note that the edges of these um, one-step or single-step uh, splints fold poorly and may need to be cut sub, uh, kind of like a tailor would do so make sure that the edges don't form ridges internally because these can produce pressure areas. Some examples now of how to put on a below elbow plaster slab. 
The purpose of using this would be for temporary immobilization of the wrist joint and stabilization of the hand and the distal forearm. The indications would be for wrist sprains and post-operative procedures. And the anatomical position is usually the wrist in 10 to 15 degrees of extension with no radial or ulnar deviation. But this position may of course vary based on the diagnosis that you are treating. There are two options when using gypsono or plaster of Paris. Uh, the standard position, um, which most people are familiar with, and then what I'd like to call is the wet fish uh, concept, where um, you make a sandwich of undercast material folded over onto a slab that is pre-prepared, and then that is applied in the same way as the one-step, single-step Dynacast pre-lead pre type of uh, fiberglass slabs. This gives the option to use a gypsona slab in the same way as a removable splint. You require delta net or stockening net, soft band padding or fell band, gypsona or Dynacross Prelude or one of the other uh, slab uh, fiberglass slabs, crepe bandage and um, coplas or elastoform. And in my hands, I prefer to use elastoform with uh, elastoplast around. This is an example of how to do the standard slab, first dwelling on the undercast padding um, and then applying short volar splint on the volar side of the um, forearm and into the hand from the proximal, uh, sorry, from uh, the two inches distal to the antecubital crease to the distal palmar crease and this should be measured um, and pre-prepared. The proximal and distal and thumb edges should have a, at least three layers of padding overlapping 100% to make sure that there is a comfortable cuff when the, the slab is applied. The Dynacast Prelude is cut to measure in the same way or the wet fish gypsona to the length determined. The splint is saturated with water and then it is uh, necessary to wring it out as much as possible, even placing a towel on a countertop and rolling the splint material with the towel to remove the moisture is uh, advised. The splint is then placed on the volar aspect of the wrist in the same way as the standard gypsona splint, remembering that the distal end should stop at the palmar crease and the proximal end should stop two inches distal to the antecubital crease so that the patient can flex the elbow. The proximal and distal edges of cast padding uh, should be folded over to prevent splint abrasions and starting at the wrist using the crepe bandage or the co plus bandage, um, a bandage technique to secure the splint is used. Remember again to hold the wrist in position until the splint is set and this may take longer than anticipated when using the synthetic casting material sling is used if appropriate. It is surprising how often the emergency room staff get this wrong and here is an example of a patient presented three weeks after fracture to her wrist with, uh, for an orthopedic opinion and you can see that this cast has been applied completely inadequately, slipped right down off the hand and in fact is immobilizing the fingers which at this stage will be a significant morbidity and difficult to mobilize. Here is an example of a one-step type splint that was used on a patient, but the wrong way around. The cast padding is on the outside. The hard, rigid fiberglass is on the inside against the skin. And note the crease on the inside, which was causing pressure against the patient's forearm. Here is uh, another example of a complication where the, the 
the um, elasticized bandaging has wrapped around, has slipped off the casting material and is causing uh, a pressure sore against the skin. So here is uh, two pictures which show a volar slab in neutral going from two centimeters below the elbow crease to the distal palmar crease. And this is a comfortable position for functional uh, uh, use of the hand and fingers possible. In the same way as uh, the upper limb back slabs can be applied poorly, so are the lower limb back slabs often applied poorly. This is an example of a patient with a below uh, knee back slab, and you can see that the patient is in equinus, um, and that in fact the knee goes, sorry, the um, slab goes too high to just well behind the popliteal fossa, uh, which is going to cause a problem when the patient tries to flex the knee. When do we use a below knee back and side slab, um, which I'm going to show you now, is when a patient presents with an ankle sprain or a fracture that requires immobilization, uh, but they're too uh, swollen for surgery, so in the immobilization and, and waiting period, and obviously for post-operative splintage. What you require to make this back and side slab is stocking net. Um, I like to use rest on foam, or you can use uh, felt. 150 millimeter or six inch soft band. Three six inch or 150 millimeter gypsoners plaster of Paris, two 150 millimeter elastoforms, and one roll of elastoplast. And what is important that is this is unrolled and then re-rolled up before the procedure starts. The stocking net is cut so that it is the length from above the knees to uh, below uh, the toes. The rest on foam is cut into four strips so that it can be applied to the metatarsal heads, the Achilles tendon and heel, and both the medial and lateral malleoli. One of the 150 millimeter gypsoners is measured and used as a side slab to go around from the medial to lateral of the ankle. And one, sorry, and two gypsona uh, slabs are used um, to form the back slab to go from below the big toe to uh, just two inches below the um, popliteal fossa. The once these are applied, the first elastiform is rolled on, as you will see in the uh, next slides, and the stocking net is turned back over the elastoform and uh, slabs to make a comfortable uh, edge. The second elastoform is then rolled on, and on top of this, the loosely uh, uh, rolled elastoplast is put from proximal to distal. Here is an example. This patient arrived with a fractured ankle, had been placed in the emergency unit into a back slab, similar to the previous example I showed. And you can see that the patient has, um, the, has slipped into Aquinas because the application was done and then the patient was just left on the bed um, while the material was setting. And if you look at the x-rays in the back slab, you can see on the far right hand side the significant Aquinas, but you can also see that the fracture is not at all reduced. And more important, you can also see the number of ridges and uh, indentations caused by the fold of the synthetic casting material which are causing pressure against the patient's skin. 
clinically, once we started removing this back slab, you can see how swollen the foot is. And there's certainly no way that any surgical intervention can be entertained with uh, this amount of swelling. So the patient needed to be put into an adequate back slab in a, a um, well-aligned position and then elevated uh, on a couple of pillows for a couple of days, at least five to seven days before surgery can be undertaken. Once again, a photograph showing the material that I described earlier, gypsona in two slabs, the one on the very left made for um, the side slab aspect, and the uh, one in the center was measured out for the back slab aspect, and that is a two, uh, that is two gypsomas. Um, there are two elastiforms, the rest on foam cut into four pieces, a stocking net, a soft band, and on top of the soft band you can see a roll of elastoplast which has been unrolled and then re-rolled up so that it is not too sticky and, and uh, it can be put on without too much tension. When we finally took the cast, the, the original back slab completely off, we saw also an unmanaged, untreated abrasion on the anterior medial aspect of the patient's uh, ankle, and this required dressing. The patient was then uh, put onto the um, in, into an adequate position, and the assistant was made to hold the leg in a comfortable position with her left elbow locked into her side and then um, with the stocking net pulled down to get all the creases out uh, the rest on foam was applied here onto the medial malleolus and over the tender achilles onto the heel and the same was done onto the lateral malleolus and here you can see that one, uh, the fourth uh, piece of rest on foam is put um, over the metatarsal heads. Then the soft band is rolled in a uniform manner around the leg. Once the soft band is completed, uh, completely rolled on, the side slab is first put on and then the back slab as shown and a point of interest here the assistant is attempting to be helpful by holding uh, the back slab in place so that it doesn't fall down um, and she's using a finger and this is a negative because if she develops an indentation there that could cause a pressure sore what you can also see is that I've asked somebody else to come and help another pair of hands to help hold that back slab uh, in place so that the assistant, the uh, first assistant, can take her finger away and we can make sure that is smooth. The first rest, on, uh, sorry, the first uh, elastiform is rolled over and then the stocking net is peeled backwards over the edges and then the second elastiform is rolled over to make a neat. Um, construct. Following this, the elastiform is then rolled over starting at the top uh, uh, approximately and going from proximal to distal. One entire roll of elastoplast is utilized and we have gone from a back slab that looked like this with the x-ray that we uh, saw previously to a back and side slab like this, which is far more comfortable for the patient. Uh, some words about a long arm or above elbow cast, um, a full cast using the soft band or undercast padding. Um, it's important to wrap the elbow joint in a figure of eight pattern in order to fully encompass and protect the soft tissues and bony prominences of the elbow. It is always more difficult to work across um, a wrist and uh, 
elbow joint at the same time. So having assistance um, when applying this sort of cast is critical. Um, and it's important to take cognizance of the bony um, prominences of the elbow and also the area around the thumb and palm, which needs clearance as you would for a below elbow cast. Um, and the cast should also go up to the knuckles, in other words, on the volar side to the distal palmar crease, so the patient is able to use their thumb and all four fingers um, adequately. A few words about the U-slab uh, splint, which is often used for uh, fracture humerus. The purpose is to support the humerus and prevent movement at the fracture site. The indications are for either temporary immobilization of mid-shelf humerus fractures or uh, often the use lab can be used for um, complete uh, definitive treatment of a fractured humerus. It's important to understand that the use lab works by assisting gravity to have the um, fracture lie in a, in a reduced position. And the anatomical position is often with the humerus resting in the torso, supported in a sling and the elbow flexed to 90 degrees. Some slides showing how we go about using a use lab. And for this, I often do use uh, synthetic splinting. Um, if you're using synthetic splinting and they come with their own padding, it is not necessary to ad use additional undercast padding as this will make the construct uh, too bulky. However, if you're using uh, Dynacast, um, sorry, uh, Gypsona Plaster of Paris, one must obviously use um, proper undercast padding. The application method is to measure the patient's arm length starting two inches proximal to the AC joint going around the lateral elbow and up into the medial aspect of the elbow, stopping two inches distal to the axilla. It's usually uh, advisable to over measure this by a couple of inches um, as it's easier to fold the uh, edges back than to, and it's impossible obviously to make it longer. One would start putting the splint in the axilla, so opposite to how we measured it, you start at the axilla level and come around the medial aspect of the elbow over the lateral aspect of the elbow and up over the shoulder. It's often easy to see uh, to uh, get assistance from the patient in this application, as you can see on the picture, by having the patient lean slightly to the one side, allowing the arm to hang like a pendulum, a bell, um, a ringer in a bell, using gravity to help maintain or hold the reduction. You can see also that the patient is holding their injured arm hand with their good arm hand so that they stay in that anatomical position. If you have an assistant, ask them to hold the ends of the Dynacast prelude or gypsona slab um, in the axilla and over the AC joint. These are the areas where it will slip and, and lose position. Obviously, starting at the distal third of the forearm, use a, uh, I, I use a cohesive bandage, a co-plus, or um, an elastiform bandage to secure the splint wrapping the arm, as I mentioned for the above elbow cast in the figure of eight manner, to support the um, cast material against the distal humerus. The patient's then put into the anatomical position that they all would uh, be expected to be in in the sling. You can see again using the good arm to support the arm, uh, the injured arm. And you can see that the applicator is applying pressure uh, against the arm holding the anatomical position while the splint material is setting. If a patient has a large upper body, or in the case of a um, female patient, it is often necessary to uh, 
um, do this sort of manipulation or molding so that uh, you counteract the curvature of the upper chest and uh, avoid the fracture falling into a various position. Once the cohesive bandage uh, or crane bandage has been fully applied, it is sometimes advised to go further down the forearm and into the wrist area for extra stability. However, this is not mandatory. Uh, it's then important to work out how to splint the patient, either with a master sling or, or with a, um, a collar and a cuff type of method. The master sling uh, is sometimes counterproductive because it can actually support the elbow push upwards um, and defeat the um, positive reduction effect of gravity. There are numerous ways in which the collar and cuffs can be utilized. Um, importantly, it must be comfortable for the patient and they must be advised not to remove them. Just some additional hints about casting materials in general. I've already mentioned them, but uh, remember to roll the plaster cast or the um, uh, synthetic material over the arm. Don't pull on it. In this way, you avoid putting it on too tightly. If you're using plaster Paris, rub or caress and polish the plaster to bind the powder into of the different uh, layers into themselves and this increases the strength. Remember if you're using gypsum or plaster cast um, when it feels like the consistency of wet cardboard this is a critical tipping point and it is about to set. If you allow the position to slip slightly at this stage there will be an inherent uh, crack in the material which means that the cast will uh, break um, earlier than you expect. If you want to strengthen a cast over a joint, use the beam strip techniques to strengthen it as one would do in an engineering um, capacity. Obviously there are some complications which may affect the healing of the bone or the recovery of the patient and they may arise at the time of injury or later as the fracture heals, but they also may be as a result of uh, poorly applied casting. The important ones that are in bold include pain, compartment syndrome, deep vein thrombosis, swelling, pressure sores, wound infection, uh, thermal injuries, casts, uh, sore burns or scratches during removal of the cast and uh, joint stiffness. There are other um, complications such as null, delayed or non-union, fat embolism, nerve injuries, myositis ossificans, osteoarthritis or allergic reactions which can occur but splints and especially poor technique of splinting can aggravate all of the above. I'm going to address the following the pressure sores, compliance, reduction, iatrogenic injury, compartment syndrome and vascular disease, cast disease and record keeping. With regards to um, Pressure sores or cast sores, the causes of these, as I've said a few times in the presentation, is uh, often due to uneven bandaging techniques or insufficient padding over the bony areas. Sometimes the cast can be too tight, but sometimes also too loose, and this allows a development of a pressure sore. And obviously sometimes patients do put foreign objects inside the cast or allow them to slip down to the cast, which can cause a pressure sore. And finally, a finger or an object causing a dent on the outside of the cast while it is still soft can cause a bigger in, uh, impression uh, on the internal surface, which can cause a pressure sore over time. The prevention is obviously good casting technique, uh, as we've discussed. The signs and symptoms include a burning or blister-like pain. So if your patient presents with a burning type of sim symptom, under the cast, it behoves you to remove that cast and look for a pressure sore. 
The later signs include local heat, if there is infection, offensive smelling, staining of a cast, and fever. Treatment. Um, if it is early, one can simply cut a window in the cast for inspection. But bear in mind that this that local edema will cause the soft tissues to bulge out of this uh, window if left uh, um, uh, open. So the window must be replaced or closed by the te either temporarily strapping it back into place or permanently replastering it. Sometimes a new lid has to be made and strapped into place. If you're worrying that a foreign object is the cause of the problem, an x-ray could be helpful. And it may be necessary to change the cast. Early treatment is mandatory because uh, after a couple of hours the skin actually dies from prolonged pressure. The pain initially disappears until an ulcerated septic area develops which can then uh, actually erode all the way down to bone and take many months requiring often plastic surgery to recover. Here is an example of a lid that has been made so that it can be taken on and off to inspect the underlying wound in the cast. Compartment syndrome, you should know about uh, compartment syndrome uh, unrelated to casts, but it's good to revise it, uh, the concept um, when it comes to a cast. So groups of muscles are surrounded by fascial sheaths which create compartments containing muscles, blood vessels and nerves. If there is an increase of pressure within these compartments, you can develop what we call compartment syndrome. The rise in pressure may reduce the blood flow locally to the muscles and ultimately lead to tissue death and, if left unattended, loss of the limb. So early diagnosis is essential because one of the treatment modalities includes a fasciotomy which needs to be taken um, as an emergency. The indicators of developing a compartment syndrome are, is increasing pain which is out of proportion to that is that would be expected by the injury. If there is suspicion, uh, pain on passive movement of the extremities of the digits is also noted as a sign and pain that does not respond to analgesia. In the late cases, the patient may present with pins and needles, numbness, and muscle weakness. The pulses initially distally will be normal, but increasing weakness of pulse may occur as the compartment syndrome progresses in the later case. Treatment of compartment syndrome of a patient who is in a cast is as follows. One must bivalve the cast and split it all the way to the skin. Do not leave any strands of undercasting material in place because this may be enough to maintain the compartment pressure. Remove the limb from the cast and examine it in most instances and elevate it but not above the height of the heart. If the symptoms persist one would consider a fasciotomy. Some words about a hydrogenic injury. This is actually usually caused by the procedure and it's often due to careless application and a tardy response to the symptoms by the attending physician. One can get circulatory and nerve impairment due to unexpected excessive, excessive swelling or the cast being applied too tightly and sometimes a combination of these two when a surgical procedure is done under tourniquet um, there can be swelling afterwards and if a cast a tight cast is applied that does not allow for the swelling the patient may get circulatory and nerve impairment also there might be insufficient padding or local pressure on the areas where blood vessels or nerves are noted to be close to the skin The nerve compression will give the paresthesia sensation and arterial compression will cause the limb to appear first white, then blue, and finally black, and the limb will be cool. 
Capillary refill is also an indication of whether there's circulatory impairment. Treatment will be elevation in the early phases, unless you suspect a compartment syndrome where you need to bivalve the cast. Sometimes it is difficult to differentiate between the two, and it is advisable then to split or bivalve the cast, as mentioned under the compartment syndrome section. If there's local pressure on the nerve, simply windowing the cast over that area may be useful. What about thermal injury during application? So both plaster of Paris and fiberglass materials harden as an exotherm reaction, and the materials become hot as they set. They may become hot enough to cause a burn to the underlying skin. The factors that increase this risk is the temperature of the dip water. In the past, we used to advise the dip water to be fairly warm, just below 50 degrees centigrade, but recently recommendations are to keep it below 24 degrees centigrade. The warmer the water, the faster the uh, casting material will set, um, and the colder the water, the slower it, it will set. So the colder water gives more time for the application and molding of the cast. There may be uh, an increase in the number of layers of the material, which will then produce increased heat. We normally are going to be advised to use about 15 ply, 15 layers of gypsona um, when applying a, a plaster cast, uh, up to 20, uh, 20 to 24 ply. A common mistake is made. Um, sorry, a common mistake is made when placing a fifteen ply splint that is slightly too long. So the end is folded over, which obviously creates a portion of the cast that's thirty ply. This is above the twenty four ply, and this is an increased risk for thermal injury. Obviously, if there's less padding, it'll allow more heat to reach the skin, and um, it's advisable that there are between two and four layers of padding throughout the cast with more of the bony prominences. If you put a pillow or blankets beneath the cast and then over the cast, they may insulate the heat they produce and keep it around the limb instead of letting it disperse into the surrounding air and this may cause a thermal injury. Using alcohol or another agent uh, on the outside of a curing cast to decrease its temperatures has been advised, but this has been studied and is shown to have no reliable effect. Remember, if you apply more rolls to a cast uh, for strength, uh, rather allow for a few minutes for the original cast materials to cool off before applying the second layer. With regards to um, non-compliance, many patients uh, do not know how to assess, uh, how to uh, manage their plaster cast, and you need to assess the patient's ability to protect the cast, review their social circumstances, and always provide a sheet of uh, tips on how to manage the cast, what we call a pop form. If it's a child that you're dealing with, make sure you give the pop form uh, or cast form to the parents. Loss of reduction, of course, can occur within the cast, um, specifically when a cast is fitting snugly and then the swelling goes down over a few days the cast can become loose and require revision. And a, a high index of suspicion must be used and follow-up is important to make sure that this does not happen. But properly applied and well-molded casts reduce the risk of this happening. And serial x-rays, certainly a repeat x-ray immediately after applying a cast to make sure the position of the fracture is maintained. And then at the one week stage after the cast is applied, 
I would be advised. If um, the reduction is lost, this can sometimes be salvaged by what we call cast wedging. If the fracture is still fairly fresh and the fracture site is still expected to be mobile, the cast can be partially cut and wedged in an attempt to reposition the fracture. X-rays are used to measure the appropriate place for the cut to be made and the direction of the wedging to be performed. One can do an opening wedge or a closing wedge uh, type of manipulation. Straight after doing the wedging, um, repeat X-rays should be taken to confirm an improved position of the fracture and then the cast can be completed around the wedging area to maintain that position. Of course, if a fracture is immobile or requires manipulation that cannot be done by wedging alone, the cast needs to be removed for repeat manipulation and replacing, and replacing the new cast. And remember that cast wedging will not uh, be able to address a shortened fracture requiring um, length. So ultimately, if the reduction cannot be maintained in a cast, surgery may be necessary. What about the concept of cast disease? This is in fact a complex regional pain syndrome that uh, often occurs or has been um, uh, noted to occur when people are left in cast for too long. With this cast application, it probably relates to nerve injuries and there have been many different names in the past. There is gait, a gait theory of spinal dysreflexia that is supposed to be responsible, and the cast uh, disease is characterized by osteopenia and stiffness and uh, disuse of the arm, and the bone scan is uniformly hot. Treatment, however, is controversial. Prevention is important and uh, making sure that you apply a comfortable cast and you keep the, the digits moving uh, and the patient is aware of um, their cast uh, management this will usually avoid the development of this complex regional pain syndrome. And finally, record keeping. This is essential. Um, uh, one must document all information, the type of fracture, the date of application, the instructions given to the patient, the therapeutic plans, making sure that the patient understands this. Removal of the cast, there's a specific technique um, using an oscillating saw. Remember that it's important to show the patients that the saw does not spin but actually vibrates. And the cast is removed by utilizing a series of up and down motions combined with a linear movement. You hold the cast uh, removal unit with one hand, move the switch to on, and then using the thumb or the forefinger as a, as a gauge, to press the blade into the cast. The blade should be pushed down and then lifted up slightly, moved and pushed down again and then lifted up slightly. This should be done in a steady way going uh, along the length of the cast and do not exert excessive pressure. Here is another illustration of how the cast should be removed. Remember never to drag the blade across the cast because it may scratch the skin. And finally, also remember that when specifically with removing synthetic casts, the blade can get really hot and sometimes you have to uh, pause, allow the blade to cool down before proceeding so that you don't cause a thermal burn.